Hello everyone and welcome to today's video. I am Dr. WD40 and today we are going to talk about the chemistry of life. Now I know chemistry can be its own course on its own, but we're going to kind of focus on the importance to understand life and how we form the major macromolecules of life. So I'm going to make this in two parts. The first part is going to be focused on the basic building blocks. So talking about, you know, the different amounts that make us up uh, as a human. So the different atoms in us, concentrations of each. And then we're going to look at the properties of the periodic table, just an overview. Then we'll look at some of the key bonds that we have between these atoms. So you've got ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and hydrogen bonds. So we're going to talk a little bit about electronegativity. And then with that, with the polar bonds that form in these covalent bonds, we're going to talk about it and relate it to the importance of water and why water is essential for life and the properties of water that make life possible. So again, a short little video going over the basic building blocks. Part two then is going to go into the biochemistry of life in building macromolecules. So let's hop right into it. So right here to start out, um, just a little summary of what we're made of. So in our body, we are made of uh, around 65% oxygen. So we can see that over here, you know, around 65%. That means that's because most of us, well, most of our body is water, H2O. H2O, if you look at the atomic mass on a periodic table, oxygen is around 16 atomic mass units, and hydrogen is only around one atomic mass unit. So if we are mostly water, that oxygen really adds up, and that's why we are 65% oxygen. If we look at some of the other compounds, carbon, of course, is very important. It's the building block of all of our organic molecules, and the study of carbon is organic chemistry. Hydrogen, then, is also very important. So we are mostly carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and phosphorus. Uh, calcium, this is a very, very important ion in um, muscle contractions, uh, bone mineralization, and uh, we'll talk about some other features throughout anatomy and physiology. Potassium and sodium are very important in uh, action potentials and nerve stimulus, so sensory inputs and outputs. Uh, without those, we wouldn't be able to send signals down our axon. Sodium also is very, very important in kidney regulation and um, blood volume. Uh, so we'll talk about the kidneys in a much later video in anatomy and physiology, too. Sulfur is important in protein folding uh, via cysteine amino acids. Uh, and then there are other elements as well. Chlorine is usually we find in a negative form, and that helps when we start making what's called resting membrane potential. Magnesium, also important in bones, and also we find it as an important cofactor in enzymes. And then we have some other trace elements, which these are all less than 0.1%. And I'm only going to mention one of these uh, because it's very important. Uh, iron is less than 1%. I think it's actually 0.1%. And iron is what we find at the uh, center of the hemoglobins in all of our red blood cells. And that without iron, we wouldn't be able to transport oxygen throughout our body and then have CO2 leave the body. So even though it's a trace element, doesn't mean we can live without it. Um, so now, just a little brief summary of the periodic table, uh, just to remind you of the importance of it. So in biology, we ignore most of it. Uh, let's say we ignore all these. Um, we ignore these ones no one cares about. These ones we don't care about. Uh, the noble gases don't really do much in biology. Uh, let's cross these ones out. Um, let's see here. So sodium is important. Potassium is important. Calcium is important. So these ones are important. Hydrogen is important. And then carbon, uh, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and fluorine a little bit. So we'll circle that. But right there are the main ones. And then there are some other ions in here. You know, uh, this is where we have copper, zinc, um, where there, right there's our iron. So there are still some important ones out here in the transitional elements. But for the most part, we just care about the ones I circled here. Now, remember when looking at the periodic table and drawing an atom, let's say we're drawing a carbon atom. So if you're not sure how to draw an atom, there are some other great videos on that. I'm not going to jump into details on drawing you know, the atomic structure here. So remember, the six represents the proton number. And so at the center of a carbon, we have six protons. For carbon to be neutral, we have to have six electrons. So as we go across on the periodic table, the number of uh, electrons 
increases. And as we go down on a periodic table, the number of orbitals or shells increases. So here, carbon is in row two, so we have two shells. The first row only has two electrons, so hydrogen, helium, it's all that we have in that first shell. And then the second one, carbon is one, two, three, four. Four over, so we know there are four electrons in that outer shell. And this is what makes carbon so unique. These four electrons make it want to bind, make four other bonds. So carbon is what's called, it has a valence of four or a binding capacity of four. So if I were to draw something like methane, we would see carbon having four bonds. And that's because each of these electrons are forming what's called a covalent bond to hydrogens, which we're gonna talk about how that forms later. Um, so some other essences of the periodic table is electronegativity. So electronegativity increases to the right of the periodic table. So over here with oxygen, nitrogen, um, sulfur, um, the phosphorus, all these are electronegative atoms that we find in the body. So if you see those, imagine a pooling of electrons coming towards them. All right, so that's, that's just the basics of the periodic table. I'm not gonna go into great details on it uh, because a lot of other courses probably already have. We're focused on the importance of the periodic table in terms of anatomy and physiology. So to do so, we have to talk a little bit about ionic bonds. So ionic bonds, as a reminder, is a transfer of electrons. Uh, so here on a sodium atom, there is one free electron in that outer ring. So remember, sodium would have another inner one in here. And then out here would be, or there'd also be another ring that's filled with eight. Because if we look at where sodium is on the periodic table, it's down here in row three. So we have three rings. So this, this ring here would then have eight electrons. I won't draw them all. But that outer ring has one electron. It's very unstable. An atom is stable when it has a full outer shell. Typically, that means eight electrons. In the case of hydrogen or helium, that's two electrons in that first shell. So sodium wants to get rid of that electron. And so it gives it to chlorine. Chlorine, if we look at where it is on the periodic table, chlorine is over here in row seven, or I mean column 17, or we can think of it as column seven, meaning it has seven electrons in that outer shell. So it needs one more. So it, at, it actually steals that electron from sodium. The resulting effect here is that sodium now has a plus charge and chloride has a negative charge. So this is called a cation and this is called an anion. And this is how we form our ions in a body. In our body, we call these electrolytes. So electrolytes are very, very important in maintaining uh, membrane potential uh, for um, muscle contraction. Uh, the list goes on and on for the importance of electrolytes. And, but this is in essence how they form. They form via ionic bonds and they can form crystals. So they're not crystals inside our body because water breaks them apart. And we're gonna talk about how water does that. Water is a very, very important solvent that allows these crystals to dissolve. And then it keeps them in ionic form when they're in our body because they're surrounded with water molecules. But it's really cool how that works because sodium alone is very dangerous. But that's the basics of ionic bonds. Again, it's that transfer of electrons where it's actually getting rid of that electron. Now, the next type of bond is called a covalent bond. This is much easier to draw if, let's say, we just have uh, a carbon. And there's that inner ring with two electrons. There's that next ring. I'm not going to draw the so carbon. Again, just as a reminder, there's number six. So six electrons total. So four free electrons, and it has that valence of four. So what I'm gonna draw right now is methane. Uh, so methane is CH4, so four hydrogens. So I'll draw those real quick, going around the outside here, drawing that one shell. Oops, there's one, and then here's the last. So now, what a covalent bond is, is a sharing of electrons. So what that means is, this hydrogen wants two electrons in the outer shell. This carbon wants eight electrons. Right now, it only has four. So what happens is there's this overlap between these two shells. So now this elec these electrons think they each have the other. So this is, makes a sharing of all these. So when all these share then, we form this covalent bond. And typically, we write this just like I wrote earlier for methane. We write it like this um, with a single line. Each line represents a pair of shared electrons. If I were to make this larger, you could draw it like that. Uh, so if you draw the bluest dot structure, you could draw these electrons bounded out 
just like so. So this is an equal sharing of electrons. This is called a nonpolar covalent bond. So that if we were to draw the charge distribution around methane, it'd be an equal charge around. There'd be no sidedness. There'd be no, you wouldn't be able to say, oh, okay, this side is a little more partially positive and this side is a little more partially negative. It's an equal distribution of electrons all the way around, so you can't pick an end. Um, now we're going to talk about polar covalent bonds. See, polar covalent bonds are essential for life. I keep writing an A there. So polar covalent bonds. That means an unequal sharing of electrons. It's still a covalent bond, but it's an unequal sharing of electrons. So this is easiest to see in this diagram down here. So what happens in this water molecule, again, so in this oxygen in the center here, um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So oxygen has six, but it forms a covalent bond. Um, so there are typically two free electrons out here, forms a sharing with two hydrogens. So we have, of course, H2O or you, know, you can draw it like this, the Mickey Mouse molecule. And right here we have those covalent bonds to those hydrogens. So, but one problem with this is oxygen is what's called electronegative, meaning it's a big bad bully and wants to pull the electrons towards it. So it's an unequal sharing of electrons. So what happens is, as this symbol shows here, I'll write it a little larger, Oxygen feels like it's partially negative, and these hydrogens feel like they're partially positive. So if we look at this three-dimensional model down here, there's a pool of electrons towards that oxygen. So if we were to draw like the electron density cloud here, it would be a higher abundance. So if we draw the electrons, a higher abundance up here compared to down here. So this side, more electrons partially negative compared to that side, which feels partially positive. And that's the essence of these um, polar covalent bonds. Now, one thing that these water molecules can do then is form what's called hydrogen bonding. So water can bind to itself and its surroundings. So if I were to draw a water molecule here, we can form a hydrogen bond. So here's one mole water molecule. We draw another one right beside it. And remember, we'll just draw one here, partial positive, partial negative. Remember, opposite charges attract. So what happens is the hydrogen bond forms right there. So this is called a hydrogen bond. I'll just write H bond for simplicity. And so that all that is is a charge attraction. You can think of this as surface tension on water. So some spiders can walk on water. You fill up a glass, you can get a cusp at the top of that glass until you add that drop, that surface tension breaks, and the water breaks. So that is, you're actually seeing those, that tension of hydrogen bonds. So it's really, really neat how that works. Um, now, that we've talked about all that, we can look at water and how it, it's essential and important in life. The first quality of water is has a, high, has a high specific heat. What does that mean? High specific heat means that it the molecule resists changes in temperatures, um, or it can absorb large, large amounts of heat until the temperature changes. And this is because of the hydrogen bonds and the polar nature of water. Uh, so think of the lake outside. Um, the air temperature varies drastically from night to day. The water in that lake does not, and that's because of the high specific heat of water. Compared to something like copper, you put a copper pan on the stove, it heats up very, very quickly compared to a copper pan with water in it. The next one here is high heat of vaporization. So this means when water evaporates, it gives a cooling feature because of how much heat is stored in it. So that is really important in life. It helps regulate our body temperature. So when we get hot and we start sweating, the purpose of sweating is for that sweat to evaporate and give us a cooling sensation. So if you ever sweated and you've touched yourself, you, you feel a little cooler if that evaporation of that sweat is happening. The next important feature of water is that it's a polar solvent. So one thing that I want you to remember is like dissolves like. Polar things dissolve polar things. Polar things include salts, so sodium chloride, uh, calcium, Things, calcium chloride, things like that, also dissolves other polar substances or charged substances such as our proteins, sugars. Anything that moves through our blood that needs to be dissolved is dissolved by water. That's because if we look at something like a sodium ion here, what happens is that the water molecule, so this is positive charge, the oxygens actually surround it. 
Oops. So this is surrounded by water molecules, forming what's called a hydration shell. And there'd be a lot more water molecules, but I'm just drawing a few for simplicity. Remember, these are all partial negatives. So this little hydration shell forms around the sodium, keeping it dissolved. Um, this is this changes based on temperatures as well. So think about if you got an iced coffee and added sugar after it cooled down, it's a lot harder for that sugar to dissolve. Whereas when that water was, when that coffee was hot, the sugar dissolves really, really easily. And that's because um, when you increase the heat content, you increase the thermal energy. Um, and so you can dissolve things faster. Next important part here is reactivity. We're going to talk about this a lot more in part two, and this deals with the making and breaking of chemical bonds in our body, or the building of macromolecules. So when we build these bonds, uh, water is required. Well, water is removed from that reaction. However, when we break bonds, water is needed to cut those bonds. It's called a hydrolysis reaction. Without water, we wouldn't be able to go through those hydrolysis reactions in our body. And so when you eat proteins, you wouldn't be able to break them down into separate amino acids and be able to absorb them. And the last important thing that water has, at least in terms of our life, is a cushioning effect. So take an example, our brain. Our brain is sitting in a cavity of cerebral spinal fluid. So about 97% of our brain mass is actually held up by sitting in that cerebral spinal fluid, which, which is just pretty much water and ions and glucose and some other little things in it. So it's not much. It's just sitting in there, it's floating in that, and it helps protect the brain. If it wasn't for that, the brain would crush under its own weight. The brain is a very soft and delicate tissue. That's why repeated head traumas are so dangerous. Um, so that would be the cushioning effect with water. So in this episode, uh, we just talked about the importance of water, uh, polar bonds, Nonpolar covalent bonds, ionic bonds, we went through a summary of the periodic table and talked about the different abundances of various elements in our body. So if you have any questions, please let me know. In next video, we are going to be going into details on the major macromolecules of life, so our lipids, our proteins, our nucleic acids, and our carbohydrates. And we're going to also talk about some inorganic ones too. All right, hope you have a great day. Hello again. Thank you for watching my video. I'm glad you could come by. If you enjoyed this content, feel free to do that thing where you like and subscribe. Um, also, if you're interested, I prepare and record all of these videos live on Twitch. After the recordings, we do a post recording question and answer section. And then sometimes I play games where any question is fair game as I game. Also, on Twitch, I'm a co-founder of a wonderful community called the Knowledge Fellowship, or TKF. Our goal is to seek and share knowledge with others while live streaming. We feature streamers who cover biology, law, physics, chemistry, geology, photography, health and fitness, psychology and mental health, rocket science and aeronautics, programming, and tons of different practical EDU streams. Feel free to check out TKF at the link in the description and join the very active Discord community. Hopefully, you'll find something that interests you. With that, I'll see you all next time and have a wonderful day. Remember to seek knowledge and challenge everything.